Hi everyone. First, let me say that this presentation is not intended to be medical advice and is certainly not intended to replace directions from your doctor. I made this presentation in response to a lot of questions on social media groups regarding semaglutide. It's also known as Ozempic uh, or Rigovi, for example, and there are some other products as well with semaglutide. I will discuss how semaglutide works, side effects, and some thoughts on optimizing use of the drug. First, let's get right into the difference between semaglutide and your natural hormone GLP-1. GLP-1 is also called glucagon-like peptide 1. It's a hormone in your body important in regulating insulin release, use of glucose, which is also sugar, and satiety, which is obviously hunger. Being a peptide, GLP-1 is made of amino acids arranged in a specific sequence, as you can see here. Here you actually see the single letter abbreviations for the amino acids. Semaglutide resembles GLP-1, but it is modified in several ways, primarily to make the drug last longer in the body. First, a lipid chain was added to position 26 here to ensure semaglutide binds to your plasma protein called albumin. This actually ensures the drug is not released into your tissues too fast. Second, at position 8, the amino acid alanine was replaced with something called alpha-amino isobutyric acid to protect the drug against destruction by enzymes. So third, the amino acid arginine was substituted for lysine at position 34 to prevent the lipid modification to attach to this site uh, because they didn't want a, du a duplication of this group on another amino acid for one reason or another. Let's briefly go over how semaglutide lowers glucose. Activation of GLP-1 receptors in the pancreas increases insulin release and decreases glucagon release. These both increase glucose removal from the blood. Uh, perhaps one of the more interesting things about semaglutide is that if your glucose is low to normal, insulin release will not be stimulated by the drug. This means there's a very low risk of getting low blood sugar with this drug if it's used alone um, compared to something like insulin. So how does semaglutide actually affect glucose? This data is actually directly from the package insert. You can see that after each meal at zero, five, and then 10 hours, blood glucose does rise um, in all these different uh, testing situations that I'll talk about. However, in the patients taking Ozempic, the glucose spike was always lower than in the patients not taking Ozempic. The baseline for Ozempic is prior to any doses, so it looks just like placebo. So all you're seeing here is all these different curves that are, for example, placebo is the same as Ozempic at baseline because these patients haven't had Ozempic yet because that's the baseline. That's why they look the same on the curves. And then um, placebo at end of treatment doesn't really look that different from placebo at baseline. But notice that the patients, again, taking Ozempic, they still get an increase in glucose, but it is quite suppressed. So it is a lower, a lower response. Uh, which is what it's supposed to do. Just to revisit the question about whether hypoglycemia or low blood sugar is a risk, here's the actual data from the package insert. It shows that when glucose is low, which is on the left side here, insulin secretion is not that different comparing Ozempic to placebo. However, when glucose is high, seen on the right side here, uh, what we see is Ozempic pretty much replicates in diabetic patients, what we see in healthy patients. That is a strong insulin release response. Notice that diabetic patients without Ozempic, uh, the in, you know, in those patients, insulin release is weak in response to elevated glucose. This all means that semaglutide is a much lower risk for hypoglycemia than straight insulin. So this is likely what we all came here for. How does semaglutide cause weight loss? In a very thorough study in the journal Cell, which by the way is considered one of the more prestigious journals in the world, the scientists showed that there are neurons in the stomach that express the GLP-1 receptor. Interestingly, such neurons were not found in the intestines, and when these neurons were activated, stomach pressure increased, indicating that the stomach may shrink in response to GLP-1 activation. Also, the GLP-1 receptor was shown to be activated when the stomach was stretched by injecting saline or, or pumping uh, nitrogen gas into the stomach. This means the GLP-1 receptor is a mechanoreceptor 
that is normally activated when we fill our stomach up with a lot of food. Activating the GLP-1 receptor with semaglutide, even without a lot of food in the stomach, may trick our brain into thinking we have a full belly, and this, of course, reduces hunger substantially. Um, I do want to point out that this study was done in rodents, um, so things can be somewhat different in humans. Uh, so we're not 100% sure if it's identical, but this, this really leads us to believe that there's a lot going on in the stomach directly with GLP-1. Finally, the GLP-1 receptor was found in the brainstem, which may also be why semaglutide induces satiety, which is lack of hunger. Interestingly, part of the brainstem is involved in inducing nausea and vomiting, uh, which may be why semaglutide can cause these side effects if the dose is too high. So how does the injection work? Uh, semaglutide is injected into the subcutaneous tissue, which is mostly fat tissue under the skin. The drug slowly diffuses into the capillaries in the dermis, which results in a one to three day delay before the maximum blood concentration is achieved. Um, just a helpful tip here, it appears that some patients inadvertently leave the second cap on the ozempic needle, which means the needle never enters the skin and the dose gets wasted. Uh, so please always look through the instructions that came in the box because Ozempic, to my knowledge, is a little different from Wigovi. Um, so whether or not you need to take off that second cap, um, again, it's going to vary. So please, again, have a look at that. A question that I'm guessing is not commonly considered is whether your weight affects how diluted the semaglutide gets in your blood. In fact, body weight was shown to have a substantial effect on the average concentration of semaglutide in the blood. As you can see here, if you are lighter than 187 pounds, you will likely have a higher blood concentration, which is shown there. If you are heavier, heavier than 187 pounds, you will likely have a lower blood concentration. The standard of comparison is 187 pounds in this case, because that was the average weight of the patients in the clinical trial reported in the package insert. So this data here is directly from the package insert by the manufacturer of um, Ozempic. Inter interestingly, the manufacturer does not recommend dosing based on weight, despite this evidence. So if you're experiencing poor effectiveness at a dose that is working well for many other patients, there is a possibility um, that you weigh more than those patients that are, that are having that um, better or more effective um, result than you are. So just to give you an idea what, what these numbers are on the very bottom, these are just relative concentrations. So in the midpoint, one is the exact average that they found in the study, the average concentration um, over the, the duration of dosing for that semaglutide. So below this is obviously a low, lower than average concentration, above this is higher than average concentration. So in the case that uh, you may be heavier than the average patient, of course this is used for weight loss, but you still may be heavier than the average patient you may need to move up to a higher dose to achieve the desirable weight loss. Always speak to your physician before making any decisions like these, of course. One of the real positives about semaglutide is that it is not a small molecule. Rather, it is a small protein. This means it's actually bigger than most small molecule drugs, or all of them in reality. This means that it's not likely to interact with other drugs because it is not metabolized in the liver. It is mostly broken down by proteases, which are um, enzymes that degrade proteins in the blood. And then it is eliminated in the urine and in the feces. Okay, so the obligatory discussion on side effects here. This may be more useful to those who are just considering taking semaglutide, since if you're already on it, you'd be familiar with most of these. The more common side effects are belching, which is described as sulfur burps for some people, uh, not for myself, but I would imagine it depends on what you eat in your gastric acid and things like that. But sulfur burps is, is commonly described in social media. Abdominal pain, not that common. Diarrhea and constipation are fairly common. Nausea, vomiting, uh, fairly common. Altered taste, some people have an altered taste for many foods. For me, strangely, one day I was eating French fries and they tasted bitter. No one else had a problem. So um, you just never know exactly what's gonna taste different. I do, I do enjoy the taste of most foods still. Hair loss, while well, that is not on the package insert, as far as I could tell, that seems to be popping up a lot on social media. I'm not gonna get into um, ways to prevent that or, or reverse that here, 
because I think a lot of it would just be guessing. So this brings us to the big question, what about uh, cancer? In the package insert, thyroid cancer was found in rats and mice at a blood concentration similar to that which can be found in patients. This was a statistically significant increase in thyroid cancer in the rodents, but the actual percent increase was not reported in the insert as far as I could tell. So um, do I worry about it? I certainly do a little bit, but I also know that my weight was and still is putting me at a definite risk of many terrible morbidities. Everything from joint pain, trouble breathing when bending over, trouble talking without taking deep breaths intermittently, um, higher risk of heart attack, sleep apnea, and no less significant is the loss of confidence for some people in public settings. So I'm taking the risk, although it is not very calculated, because we still do not know the extent of risk in humans for this specific cancer. Finally, the package insert has a warning that semaglutide should not be used in patients with a history or family history of thyroid cancer. I want to make it clear that my intention in this discussion is to inform about the data and certainly not to recommend any specific decisions. Again, speak to your healthcare professional regarding anything that you're concerned with. Another issue that comes up a lot on social media is that semaglutide isn't working for some people for weight loss. The first point I would like to make is that you should not consider a treatment failure until you have at least reached the therapeutic dose suggested by the manufacturer. That could be from one to two milligrams for some patients, 2.4 milligrams for Wegovy. If you're on 0.25 or 0.5 and not experiencing weight loss, well, that's expected actually. You are just allowing yourself to adapt to the side effects of the drug while you gradually reach the effective dose. Now, there's one theoretical reason for treatment failure that I want to discuss. First, please keep in mind that this is theoretical and not proven to be the reason. About 1% of patients develop antibodies to semaglutide, meaning their body is reacting to it as a foreign substance, which it is. Although these patients may not have a true allergy to the drug, the question is whether or not these antibodies are preventing the drug from actually working. This is a very reasonable question since coating the drug with antibody would prevent binding to the GLP-1 receptor. And if the drug actually gets destroyed by the immune system targeting of the antibody, then the chances of failure are even greater. Interestingly, 0.6% of total patients on semaglutide also developed antibodies that bound to their natural GLP-1. I worry a little bit about whether these patients will then have poor natural GLP-1 function and therefore poor glucose tolerance and weight gain as a consequence of using semaglutide and developing those self-reactive antibodies. Again, this is just theoretical at this point in time. Several patients report breakthrough hunger prior to the next scheduled dose. I would like to use the next few minutes to address the likely reason for this issue. We'll be focusing on pharmacokinetics, or in other words, how the blood concentration relates to the dose and frequency of administration of semaglutide. What we see here is a plot of the hypothetical semaglutide concentration over several months of weekly injections. I chose a dose of two milligrams per week, which is the highest recommended dose for, for Ozempic. You may ignore the complex kinetic values in the table if you like, but they were taken directly from the package insert or some journal articles if necessary. The table tells us that most of semaglutide is absorbed from the subcutaneous injection, that is 89% bioavailability. You will also notice that even though this hypothetical patient is taking the same dose every week, the blood concentration is rising more after each dose until it reaches a steady average. This is why using the same dose for four weeks is still increasing your blood concentration over time. Once you reach steady state, that is about 28 to 35 days since you started taking the medication, you will still experience spikes and dips in the concentration, but the average will not rise unless you increase the dose. Now notice how there's a substantial difference in the peak concentration to the trough, which is the low concentration, even during steady state, as you can see here. It is actually 0.231 micrograms per milliliter at the peak, and then goes down to 0.165 micrograms per milliliter at the trough, which is about a 30% drop. Um, now let's see what would happen if we gave the drug twice as often, which is, you know, because it's seven days a week, so it's going to be 3.5. So we're just saying hypothetically, if you took it every 3.5 days, but you took half the dose, so the same weekly dose, right, if you made those changes, what would it look like 
And again, I'm, I'm using a pretty complicated pharmacokinetic calculation that I inserted into a spreadsheet to, to estimate what this will look like. The same steady state concentration, but the peaks and troughs are much less severe. We see peaks of 0 0.212 and lows of 0 0.193 micrograms per milliliter, which is about only a 9% drop from peak to trough. We can expect this change to reduce side effects from peaks and hunger from troughs. I was kind of curious about what you all thought about this and if anyone has tried this. Again, this is not something you'll find in the package insert and it's something you should communicate with your, again, your healthcare professional before you make any changes. Curious if anyone has tried this, so please let me know in the comments. Of course, one concern is how do you get enough needles to use it more frequently, uh, but I won't be discussing those options here. So in summary, semaglutide is a modified form of your natural GLP-1. The modifications primarily allow the drug to last longer in the body. Activation of GLP-1 enhances your insulin response to glucose unless you are a type 1 diabetic. Activation of GLP-1 may work on weight by stimulating GLP-1 receptors in stomach neurons and in the brainstem. Although not addressed in the prescribing information, which is also the package insert, adjusting frequency of injection and dose may reduce the degree of side effects and pre-dose hunger. One last reminder, this is not medical advice and any change should be discussed with your doctor. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.